All right, I think we're about ready to get started. Everybody wants to take seats. Um, my name is Michelle Berger. I'm the associate scientist here at Shaw Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Louise Roy. But before I do that, we have some business to attend to. Um, the very first thing is I want to announce some late breaking news that Dr. Charlie Rolski, our senior research scientist, is now also our executive director. And so there's... And if you're interested, there are more details in the press release on back, and it's also in this week's papers, the weekly packet and the Ellsworth American. Okay. So how do I advance my slide here? Sam. <laughs> Why isn't it advanced? Why isn't it advanced? Because your cursor is over on the other screen. Oh, well, that's clever. Okay, there we go. Um, so first I'd like to tell you about some events we have upcoming. Um, these are two events organized by our wonderful group of summer interns who are all sitting up front here. We've got Autumn and Ella and Eugene. And <laughs> The first event is every Tuesday from 12 to 2. They are holding office hours. This is a time when anybody who's interested can come in and talk to them about their work or things going on at Shaw Institute, or if you have any ideas for future programming, you can chat with them about it, and they would love to talk to you. The second event, also organized by our interns, is an art in science and science and art evening. This will be a time to talk about how nature is influencing art, but also how art and the products of art can have an effect on nature. So this will be an open discussion and they will have examples of some of their artwork and there'll be some other local artists there as well. Our next lecture is going to be on August 8th. It will be uh, Rosemary or Rosie Seaton. She is the Marine Mammal Stranding Coordinator at Allied Whale College of the Atlantic. So she will be talking about the Marine Mammal Stranding Program in Maine. And she has also been a very long time collaborator with Shaw Institute without the work that her, her organization and other organizations do. Um, we would not have been able to do our longtime marine mammal stranding, uh, marine mammal research program here at Shaw. I also want to thank a couple of local businesses for supporting our lecture series. Uh, Max and Mary Alice from the Blue Hill Wine Shop provided the wine and cheese. And although Jill was not able to make it tonight, she has made it to previous lectures to serve as our bartender for the evening. And um, Louise is going to be telling you about PFAS monitoring and mitigation throughout the entire state of Maine. But we wanted to let you know that here at Shaw Institute, we've also been doing a lot of local PFAS, PFAS monitoring. This project was specifically uh, stimulated by the recent discovery of high PFAS levels in the wells at a couple of our local elementary schools, particularly in Surrey and Blue Hill. So recently we've been doing a lot of work with the town of Surrey to monitor um, surface water, public tap water, and also private tap water in Surrey. We've also done some work in Blue Hill, Ellsworth, and the greater Bangor area. So, um, and after tonight's talk, if any of you are interested in having your own well tested, we do have water test kits here. So please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you out with that. And if you wanna find out more about the local results, we'd be happy to talk to you more. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, I have known Louise since she was a summer intern here at Shaw back in 2016, when she was helping with our 
a coastal monitoring program looking at bacteria monitoring and microplastics. Um, she has since gone on to complete her master's degree in oceanography from the University of New Hampshire. And she now works for the Maine Department of Environmental Protection as an environmental hydrogeology specialist, where she helps to monitor and remediate um, a variety of chemical contaminants, contaminants throughout Maine, including PFAS. So with that, please. Is this loud enough? Yes. Great. I used to be a teacher, so I can usually project okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, like, got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like Michelle said, my name is Louise. I'm a geologist. The short, short term is geologist uh, with the state of Maine. Um, I was an intern here, had a great time. I come back to Blue Hill any chance I get um, because I, it's just a very welcoming com uh, community. I will, I will, a disclaimer, I'm a scientist. And so when I say something is cool, I definitely don't mean it's cool from like, because we're talking about contaminants, the human health impacts are very, you know, it's very nerve wracking and it's bad, but as a scientist, these chemicals are really interesting. So I just want to, if I get excited, it's not, you know, I'm not, a, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, okay, so my, let's see. So outline for the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and some of the stuff I used to work on. And then I'm going to go into the ABCs of PFAS. It's going to be a little chemistry heavy. So I apologize if, uh, First of all, I apologize if you're an organic chemist because it's going to be like down here. And for the non-scientist, it might be a lot, but I think it's really important when something's this intimidating to um, to really start to understand the basics of the of the, these um, chemicals. I'm going to talk a little bit about the PFAS, the history of PFAS, and then some of the really amazing work that the state of Maine is doing in response to this. Um, so when I was in Blue Hill, I got to do a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, so a lot of the harmful algal bloom um, monitoring, we did the beach monitoring, but we also worked with the allied whale and got to go um, to a whale stranding that uh, on um, North Haven that the whale had passed, um, but it was a really cool opportunity. Madeline Woods and Elizabeth who were here, Madeline was the old research coordinator. Um, and yeah, again, I loved my time here. And when I was an intern here, I remember setting up the, um, the chairs for these talks and thinking, I hope I do something cool enough that they invite me to come talk here. <laughs> and I'm so excited to be here now. <laughs> um, so when I started, when I left here, I went to the DEP and um, I originally started working on petroleum sites um, in the state of Maine over 50% of homes are heated by heating oil. And one of the tanks is, an image of one of the tanks is there on the right side of the screen. Um, and these are really common at homes, either inside or outside. A lot of you probably have these at home. Um, and they will corrode, um, you know, if they're outside, a filter might get broken off by ice falling off of the roof or something, and um, you get oil spills. So in the state of Maine, there's three oil spills every two days or 1.5 oil spills per day on average in the state. Um, and it's not an oil spill like in the, you know, Gulf of Mexico kind of scale. It's something as simple as, you know, a couple gallons here and there, but they do happen very often. Um, and I like to talk about heating oil as a precursor or to, before I talk about PFAS because they're actually really similar compounds. Um, uh, petroleum is made out of a chain of carbons that are surrounded by hydrogen atoms. Um, and so they're strung together and the different lengths have different functions. So if you're looking at home heating oil, it's usually a chain of carbons that are anywhere between 14 and 20 carbons long. If you're looking at something shorter, uh, smaller, like gasoline, it's usually a mix of uh, six to eight carbons or nine carbons long. 
Um, so the different, sh the different lengths of those chains have different functions. Um, this is a heating oil spill that I worked on in um, the central Maine area. Um, one of the tanks, um, they actually had three tanks that were uh, connected together. Um, the tanks corroded out on the bottom and let go, and um, we did a big excavation. We recovered several hundred gallons of um, heating oil from in the ground, and it was, again, so this is where I'm talking about, it was really cool because we dug a hole and the oil just seeped right back in. Um, it was not cool for the homeowner because they were very worried about their water getting contaminated. Um, but as we dug, we were able to recover a lot of that oil. Their water never showed signs of contamination. Um, so this one was a really great success. Uh, this is an example of a gasoline station, a gas station. Um, so this is what your gas is stored in underground. These giant tanks, this is a 10,000 gallon tank. Um, and as gas stations upgrade their equipment, um, the DEP is involved in making sure that if there were any leaks in those tanks, um, that we're not just burying the problem underground. When we take those tanks out or replace equipment, um, we go out and we help sample those sites and make sure that any contamination gets taken out and that um, we're only leaving clean, pretty clean, mostly clean dirt behind. <laughs> um, this was, again, scientist. This was another really cool site that I worked on, um, an oil spill. So this is six oil, which is almost like a tar. So these are the really long carbon chains. Um, these ones move slower in the soil. Um, DOT was replacing a bridge and they did some borings and discovered the six oil in Gardner. And um, we got to go in and do this dig and it lasted an entire summer. Um, so it was really fun watching the excavators dig around. <laughs> it's really, yeah. Um, and then this is one of my sites. So the, the photo on the left is just a, to show you these trucks tip over a lot. This is an oil delivery truck. Um, but the site that I worked on is the photo on the right. There was a delivery truck um, delivering gasoline to a gas station. And um, in Belgrade, a car ran a stop sign and it T-boned the um, delivery truck. And the delivery truck rolled. It was in the middle of the winter. I think it was January 1st. And um, the gasoline leaked and it caught on fire. And everyone was got out fine. The driver of the delivery truck had a broken arm, but besides that, um, everyone was fine, except the siding on the houses melted because <laughs> there was this huge fire. Um, but how I got moved into the PFAS world was at this site, um, the firefighters actually applied AFFF, which is the aqueous film forming foam. And AFFF is amazing at putting out fires, but it is full of PFAS. <laughs> so um, when this site came about in 2019, um, it was just when the DEP was kind of getting started looking at PFAS at sites. We were just starting to get testing methods that would allow us to, for a reasonable cost, test um, PFAS in water and soil. And so as we were going through this site and testing for gasoline in the ground, we were also able to do some testing for PFAS. Um, and so that's where I got my first taste of PFAS. Um, so like I explained, so oil is a carbon chain that is surrounded by hydrogen. So the white spheres in that molecule on the left are hydrogens, and then the black spheres are carbons. And PFAS is really similar. It is a chain of carbons, again, the black spheres in the molecule on the right, except instead of hydrogens, they're surrounded by fluorine atoms. And the carbon fluorine bond is really, really strong. And that's why they're called forever chemicals, because it's really, really hard to break those bonds. Um, there is a little head on the right side of the molecule. There's different functional groups that are on there um, that will give the molecules different properties. Um, but the two big things about PFAS are that, that um, functional group head and the length of that carbon chain. So, the PFAS that we look at mostly are four carbons long, all the way up to 18 carbons long. And again, this is a little bit of chemistry here. 
Um, so the term PFAS is per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And this is a group of compounds that is over 7,000 compounds. It's a huge group of compounds. Um, the two main compounds that we, uh, that we have a lot of information about are PFOA and PFOS. So perfluorooctanoic acid is PFOA, and it's an eight carbon chain with that carboxylic fun functional group at the end. So that red head at the end. PFOS, perfluorooctane sulfonate, is also an eight carbon chain. It's just got a different head on the end. It's got a sulfur, that yellow is a sulfur atom, um, and then the oxygens and a hydrogen. And so when you're like if when you're looking in the news or if you have your water tested, um, a really easy way to tell kind of what molecules you're looking at or to break them down. And if you took an organic chemistry class ever, or sometimes in your regular chemistry class, you might learn this. Um, so PFOA, the octanoic acid is eight. Perfluorobutanoic acid is a four carbon chain. Perfluoronanoic acid is a nine carbon chain. Um, so if you see these names out there, it's pretty easy to decipher what you're actually learning about or what you're reading about. Okay, so um, so this is a the timeline for um, the history of PFAS, but it's pretty much the same timeline as the history of almost any other contaminant that we find in the environment. Um, PFAS is a really scary thing and it's really big right now, but we've been through this before with MTBA, MTBA or PCBs or um, PERC. You know, we find these new chemicals, we get really worried about it, and then we come up with ways to fix the problem and we deal with it. Um, so while this is a really nerve wracking thing and there's a lot of research and there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet, we, we're gonna figure stuff out. Um, so these compounds were developed in the, um, in the 30s and 40s and then started being manufactured uh, in the 50s to today. Um, in the 70s are when we started seeing learning about health concerns, um, but we didn't really start detecting them in the environment until the 2000s. I think the first scientific paper that I've read about environmental detection was from 2003. Um, in the 2000s, we also started phasing, as a country started phasing out the production of PFOS and PFOA and started coming up with alternatives. Um, so we, so like I said, in the early 2000s, we um, kind of real, recognized the potential health and environmental concerns. And that was mostly focused on those longer chain compounds. So those are the ones usually that have eight or more carbon carbons in the chain. So in 2002 to 2008, 3M, who was the main producer of PFOS, um, one of the main producers of PFOS, uh, as well as PFHXS. So HX is hex, which is six carbon chain. And then PFOA, the O is octo, that's eight carbon chain. Um, they started the phasing out those compounds. Um, and then in the US in the early 2010s, um, we started, we pretty much stopped making a lot of those compounds um, and the production was moved over to um, Asia and Eastern Europe, so out of the country. So in Maine, we, uh, the state of Maine, we are following um, LD-129. I feel like I cut a number off there. The interim drinking water standard put forward by the legislature, which is 20 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion for a sum of six compounds. And those compounds are PFOA, PFOS, PFDA, which is the 10 carbon chain, PFNA, which is the nine carbon chain, PFHXS, a six carbon chain, and PFHPA, um, that's a seven carbon chain. And it's important to note that in the state of Maine, uh, we have over 50% 50, 50 of our homeowners on private wells. And that's one of the highest uh, concentrations or the highest numbers in the country. We have the most people on drinking water wells. So our drinking water is really important to us here. And another important note is that these are measured in parts per trillion. Um, 
If you are testing your water for an oil compound to a toxicity level, you're looking at parts per million. If you're looking at PCBs, those are in parts per billion. And so PFAS is measured in parts per trillion, which is the equivalent of one single drop of water in 20 Olympic size pools. So it's a very, very low concentration, which is why it's really hard to test for. And it's usually really expensive um, because the labs have to be crazy, crazy uh, careful about what materials they bring in, how they test their labs, what it, cosmetics the people in the labs are wearing. Um, it's really, it's, it's a really low number. And so in Maine, there's a couple different sources. I, I think we have four main sources of PFAS to the environment. Um, there's industrial sources. So like, so primary production and then secondary manufacturing. So we are actually produce, actually producing those PFAS chemicals and then using them in a manufacturing setting. <clears throat> so places that do things like copper plating, um, making plastics or resins, coating things like uh, leather or carpet. Um, there's a lot of things that we have that we use that use PFAS. Um, if you've ever been to the Denver airport, there's really beautiful like canvas, um, like tents outside and those are coated with PFAS and they were made in Vermont. And there's a town in Vermont where their entire aquifer is contaminated because they would take that canvas and they spray the PFAS onto it. It got into the air, deposited on the land and then got into the drinking water. So Denver Airport, think twice before you go in there. No, just kidding. It's fine to go in there, but just think about it when you go in there. Um, Maine also has, uh, we estimate that we have a thousand landfills in the state, closed or open. Um, and these landfills take anything from consumer products to industrial waste, and they're just sitting there. Some of them are unlined. So things that are in the landfill can get into the groundwater. Um, it's important to note that PFAS is in a lot of consumer products, like every takeout container, um, microwave popcorn bags, uh, Scotch guard on your carpets or on furniture, um, shampoo bottles, almost all cosmetics, fingernail polish, um, Teflon, Gore-Tex, anything that needs to be oil or waterproof typically is PFAS. Um, so when you <clears throat> throw away your takeout containers or compost them, something to think about. Wastewater treatment plant. Yep. Um, so some landfills have had biosolids from a wastewater treatment plant applied as a cover system for those uh, for the landfill. So there's really strict regulations about what, like how to close a landfill, what needs to be layered on it to make sure it's protected. And so they'll sometimes they would put sludge on top to um, uh, to cover it and promote grass growth and stuff like that. So wastewater treatment plants um, sometimes have PFAS and in influent um, coming from, like if you live in a town that has a wastewater treatment plant, if you do your laundry, you throw your Gore-Tex jacket in. Um, if you have a pan with Teflon on it, you wash the dishes, you wash your hair with shampoo, and that can get into the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and then it also has, so then the sludge and biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant in the state of Maine and all over the country, I think every state in the country, those that sludge is land applied and um, used as a fertilizer. Another big source is um, aqueous film forming foam, which I mentioned before. Um, and that comes at a lot of different locations. So you can see that at military bases. So like the Brunswick Naval Air Station, there's a lot of PFAS or Cutler. Um, also at civilian airports, um, they would train to put out fires on planes. So they spray them with foam. Um, Somewhere, if you have a petroleum refinery, they probably have a store of a triple F in case something happens. Um, and then other fire training areas. Um, so we've worked with a couple different fire departments that were like, oh yeah, we have this 
area where there's these sheds and we would burn them down and practice putting them out. Um, and so those areas can potentially be a source of PFAS. Um, and then not to mention if you have just like what I was talking about, like a truck rollover or something and that truck catches on fire, they'll spray it down with the um, foam. So there's a really, like a, again, a scientifically interesting cycle that goes on um, with the PFAS out in the world where you know, we produce these compounds, they get put into the environment in a lot of different ways, either directly by stormwater discharge, excuse me, firefighting foam. Um, they can get into consumer goods and then be land applied. Um, and then they end up getting into the food and water systems and then um, exposure, cre create exposure issues for people. So that's the background information on PFAS. So I, th I hope that's enough to kind of paint a good picture for you guys. Um, so this is where Maine is really shining. So every state land applies sludge as a way to get rid of it. And Maine is the first state to ban that practice. So the legislature um, stopped that from happening. So that's in the news, there's a lot of um, issues with now that sludge has to be sent to landfills and or out of state or out of country. So dealing with um, the solids from wastewater treatment plants is a big problem. But in the past, it has been land applied as a, um, as a fertilizer to a lot of um, farm fields or uh, forestry, forested areas. So um, LD 1600 was passed by the legislature, which required the DEP to do three things, um, which is to conduct a PFAS investigation for contamination derived from the application of sludge and septage. So septage is when you have your septic tank pumped out directly, and then the truck goes and sprays it on a field. Um, sludge is what comes from a wastewater treatment plant. It might be composted a little bit and then applied to a field or a um, wooded area. Um, they also required that le landfill leachate be sampled, which we're actually almost, I believe we're almost done sampling most of the, um, the big landfills and then establish uh, uh, the land application contaminant monitoring fund. But I'm going to mainly talk about that first point, um, the PFAS investigation. So in the state of Maine, we had over a thousand of these sites that were identified, that states that were licensed by the state to receive sludge, um, to have sludge land applied. Um, we, we, I didn't do this, but the higher ups broke them down, these sites down into four different tiers. Um, and it's a completely risk-based approach to, um, uh, to this breakdown. So the tier one sites were where the most material was applied, the most sludge was applied. Um, when these are active farms, a lot of them were either dairy farms, beef farms, um, or were supplying um, corn or other feed to big farms. Um, there were a lot of homes at risk, usually uh, a lot of homes right on the perimeter of the farms. And they were mostly the biggest, the biggest sites. Um, tier two, which we're almost pretty much done with, uh, they might not have been as active. So they could be um, doing grass or corn, um, but they are usually smaller operations. They might not have had as much sludge applied or they might be um, more rural. And then tier three, again, less sludge applied, usually fewer homes at risk, not an active farm or um, very little active farm, like farm activity on site. And then tier four, there's a category that we have very little, like very, very little information about. Um, there's some sites that have licenses that maybe never got material or they're, you know, 0.6 acres that maybe something was applied to once. And we don't have a lot of information about that. Um, there were 44 tier one sites, 47 tier two sites and over hundred tier three sites. And then the rest were tier four sites. So if there were a thousand sites approximately, there's quite a few tier four sites that we don't know that much about. Um, but we are done with tier one and tier two and we're moving on to tier three. If not today, then like, I think the first week in August. 
And so the way these investigations work for the DEP is um, a team gets together to review the documents from the spreading. The, there are really detailed maps, which I'll show you some examples of. Um, and the team inv involves a project manager, a geologist, and a technician that um, helps with a lot of the sampling. We then reach out to the farmer or the new property owner and discuss soil sampling with them. Um, then we come up with a plan, a risk-based sampling plan for both the soil and the groundwater and potentially surface water. So we look at a, a geologic map of the area, um, a map of where the fields are, and we, um, we figure out which houses we want to sample first. Then we go out and do the sampling if we're permitted to by the farmer. Um, and if, if we are denied by the farmer, then we'll go out and just do uh, water sampling at the homes nearby. And then we review the data. Um, I communicate a lot with homeowners, the results, talk to them about what it means. And then if we need to do more sampling, and if not, we can close out the site. Um, and so this is a standard investigation, but I'm not sure I've had a standard site yet. Everything is complicated and there's always a lot of moving parts. And I spend a lot of time in basements <laughs> these days. I know a lot about how houses are built now. <laughs> Um, so this is Matt. He's actually one of our landfill um, project managers doing some water sampling. Usually um, the sampling we do right from the pressure tank in someone's basement or um, under a trailer. And so, uh, yeah, I've seen some stuff. <laughs> you can ask me about it after. <laughs> um, so on the right, on the left is a photo of two of our geologists doing some water sampling. This is a dug well at someone's house. So most wells in Maine are drilled down into the bedrock, um, hundreds of feet. And we have a lot, we're very lucky. We have a lot of water. I just uh, heard a presentation from a guy that did some work in California and they had to drill a well for a community that was like a half a mile deep, which was crazy. <laughs> we have a lot of water and we're very lucky. Um, so this is a dug well, which is basically they just dig a hole in the ground and surface water, they put in concrete, um, basically a concrete tube, water seeps in from the bottom and fills it up and that's their reservoir for drinking water. So our geologists here are sampling some of the water using a pump. And then that's me doing soil sampling. Um, this is a pasture at a dairy farm and a cow tried to climb into my truck a baby cow. They're very curious. If you don't hang out with cows very much, uh, very curious creatures. Um, and then on the right is a soil sample, a really beautiful soil sample that we collected um, that is uh, from up in a forested area up in the Jackman area. And um, I believe if you can see the the white layer here, I believe this is the um, this is an ash layer. So sometimes um, ash is also applied. So uh, this was a really beautiful core, beautiful scientist. Um, and so what's really makes some of these sites complicated is that we're not just, uh, you know, a lot of the press is around these farms, these small farms, but it's not only farms. Some um, of the farmland has been sold off and turned into housing developments. Um, and some of it is forestry areas that are logged either recently logged or logged a long time ago. Um, and then we have some areas that have been redeveloped into solar. Um, so we're doing a lot to get, we're, we're in a lot of different environments. Um, so I'm gonna go through two examples um, of sites that we've worked on in um, central Maine and one in kind of the south central Maine, a little bit coastal area. <clears throat> So this is a central main site. Um, they received about 21,000 cubic yards of material. This is a heavily spreaded site. Um, and this, the material is spread over about 110 acres. So between those two fields, they're probably about 50 acres each. Um, so the way that we are doing our soil sampling, we, are, we select a 10 acre area and we collect 10 cores over that whole area randomly spaced. Um, because if you accidentally poke, you know, here and the sludge was all spread there, you're going to get a, um, a really low, low bias result. Or if you happen to put your um, core through the spot where they stockpiled it, 
it's going to come back super high and it might not be representative. So we do um, 10 acre areas. So these areas are about 10 acres. I know one area, 1A is small, but there's brown tail moth along the whole area where we were sampling and I didn't want to get itchy. So that area is a little smaller. <clears throat> okay, and these are some soil results from that site. So four sample areas, 1A and 1B are in the same field, 2A and 2B are in the same field. <laughs> So the soil results, um, the way I've laid this out is that the long chains are on the left and the shorter chains are on the right. So all the way to the left is an 11 carbon chain and that's a pretty long carbon chain. Then we have 8,2 FTS, 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. This is um, one of the compounds that was supposed to replace uh, some of the other PFAS compounds, but then got phased out because it just breaks down into PFOA. Um, PFDA, which is a 10 carbon chain, PFNA, which is a nine carbon chain, and then it goes on um, to the right. So even within these two fields that had hypothetically the same spreading history, we have a huge variety of results. Um, soil is usually measured in parts per billion or nanograms per gram. Um, and so you can see that 8,2 FTS, one sample was about 240 parts per billion. And then the sample, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the sample from the field next door was less than 20 parts per billion. So it's a really interesting, I mean, it's, it's really variable. Um, the same thing with PFOS, one field, one area had um, like 170 or 180, I think it was. And then the part right next to it was, um, again, less than 20 parts per billion. So that's one thing that makes it really complicated. <laughs> so this site, um, we also got a lot of really, uh, we got a lot of water samples as well. So you notice that um, the soil results, which are on the bottom, are really heavy towards the, um, the longer chain end towards the left. You have a lot of big bars on the left side. Um, and then the water samples, what I plotted here were samples that had over a thousand parts per trillion. And you'll notice that in the water, we do see some of the PFOA and the 8,2 FTS, but it's dominated by those shorter chains. Mm -hmm. And that's because the shorter chains actually move faster throughout the environment. So not only do they not stick in the soil as much, they actually move through, um, they get washed out of the soil easier. They, when you consume them, they actually get flushed out of your body. They don't bioaccumulate as much as the long chains do. Um, so this site is, Again, really cool because you see what you want, like what you expect to see, the long chains sticking around in the soil being really sticky and then the short chains kind of flushing out and getting into the groundwater. So then um, this is a really horrible table, but I wanted to show this because it just shows how good the filters are. So um, for the state, for this program with LD1600, we are putting carbon filters in, which are two, I, I say, tell people they look like tanks of helium if you go get balloons filled up. Um, and they're filled with a granular carbon. And they do a fantastic job um, taking PFAS out of the water. So that top bar across is um, the initial sample for this home. And the sum of six on the right is uh, 2050. So it's a pretty high concentration. And then we first took the sample. Um, in that April, and then we went back in August and sampled with the filters, and the NDs are for non-detect. Um, so the between filters and the after filter samples were completely non-detect, and they were non-detect for at least a year afterwards. I, I didn't pull all of the data because um, my computer would catch on fire. Uh, but, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, the filters work. So this is one of the one of the really good things. Um, about this work is that the filters do work. Like it is a really scary thing, but we have the resources to start filtering it out of the drinking water, which is the, the, first, um, the first priority. What we would expect to see if we saw a breakthrough with the filters is some of those shorter chains starting to pop, pop, pop through. So like the four carbon chain and the five carbon chains. Um, and we sample the homes every you know one to four months based on the concentrations that are in the water. So um, this is a home that we sampled monthly to start and then we moved to um, every two months or every three months later on. 
Um, this is, so that's kind of the worst case scenario. That's one of the most contaminated sites that we have. Um, drinking water, I think got up to 10,000 parts per trillion in one well, but again, the filters are doing their jobs. We have to change them out every once in a while, like less than once a year, once every two years, um, but we are able to make sure these people have clean drinking water. Um, this is another site that is down in um, kind of more towards the coast of Maine. Again, 28,000 cubic yards of material from a different source, from a different wastewater treatment plant. Um, this field, this uh, site was 300 acres though, and it was split up between 10 fields. So he had acquired a lot of land and it was in these you know, 20 to 50 acre parcels. This is the biggest field, uh, the map of the largest field from the license. And again, this is a huge success, success story. Um, we went out and did a lot of water samples or a lot of soil sampling here. And anything in black is under the, um, the soil limits that we would be worried about them uh, growing vegetables or having pasture. The red numbers are high, but it does not take, it does not take them, it does not limit them from doing some things with that land. There are some crops like potatoes um, that you can grow in soil that have has quite a bit of PFAS and the potatoes don't take that PFAS up. Um, so I'm not saying this guy is turning to potatoes, um, but uh, so there, there were some high-ish numbers here, but we sampled, it's a fairly, for Maine, fairly densely packed area. And we sampled almost 30 homes and none of them had um, levels over five parts per trillion, I think the number was. So um, this is a really great, a, a great site for me. It was a, a good um, example that you can have some high PFAS in the soils and it does not mean that it's in the drinking water, it's in your drinking water. So those are two examples that I've worked on, um, but statewide we have, um, we have taken a lot of samples. So this is as of June, we've taken 1600 or almost 1700 drinking water samples. 77% of them were under 20 parts per trillion. Um, and that is for the LD 1600, or if you look at all PFAS samples, so that's the AFFF sites um, included or some of the various other uncontrolled sites that we have. 11% um, of the sites are between 20 and 100, which in the grand scheme of things is still very low compared to some of the 30,000 um, parts per trillion we've had. 6% um, are within the 100 to 1,000, and then 4% for the LD 1600 were over 1,000. Um, when we first started this, we were terrified that the whole state, we we're going to have like 70 or 80% that were in those really high levels. Um, but the really scary work that we did to start out with, it's gotten a lot better. We're not seeing nearly as much. We found the worst of it first. Um, so the numbers under total filters installed, um, for LD1600, we've installed 335 um, sets of filters, which is about 90%. People refuse filters. Um, it does happen. So we try, uh, the filters are free. The state's covering the cost of the filters, but for whatever reason, some people are refusing them. So about 10% either aren't installed or um, have refused filters. Um, and then, so I just wanted to finish up with this. We're in a really tough spot with the, uh, everybody is, but at the DEP, we're kind of experts, but at this point, we still have very little information. Um, the top of that pyramid, we have a lot of information on PFOS, PFOA, um, cause those were the first compounds that got our attention. And as we've learned more, we've branched out. We know a lot more about PFNA, PFHPA, HXS, PFBS. And we're starting to learn more about that purple area, which is the really long carbon chains, 14 carbons, 13 carbons, 12 carbons, 10 carbons, 11 carbons long. So we're learning more about those compounds now. We're just starting to figure out about fluorotelomers, um, polyfluoral alkyl ether acids, and uh, polyfluoral ether, polyfluoral alkyl ether acids, um, which are polyfluorinated compounds which break down into PFAS, things like PFHXS, PFHXA. Um, and then 
there's 7,000 plus compounds out there. And so we still don't know so much about all of the other compounds out there. We can only test for like 30 compounds. So there's so much that we still don't know. Um, so we're, the state of Maine has this program to study these sludge sites. And it's the first state in the country that has systematically studied sludge sites. Um, other states are actually increasing the amount of sludge that they're spreading. And Maine is the first state. A lot of the other states, when we go to conferences, they're like, so how is this going? How are you doing this? They're waiting to see how we do before they start their programs. Um, I think Michigan is the next state that is taking that on. New Hampshire has done some work, um, but Maine is really at the forefront, which makes me really proud of what we're doing. Um, so this is the kind of the end of the talk. Um, just to review, PFAS are really complicated because <laughs> there's so many of them and we're trying to lump them into one group you know, we have a health advisory that lumps six different compounds into one group. Um, but there is hope. Not all these sites are bad. We have seen the worst of it and it's getting better. The sites that we're investigating are not nearly as bad as what we saw um, in 2000 or 2020, 2019. The results are generally what we expect. The samples that are the built or houses that are built right on the edge of fields or like right in fields generally have the most contamination in their water. You don't see it moving out quite as much as you might expect. The soil results, usually if there's a lot of sludge, the PFAS is higher. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do. We're still, you know, we've done almost a hundred sites so far and we still have several hundred to go with the DEP um, in this LD1600 program. Um, like I said, we presented at a lot of conferences. A lot of people want to know what we're doing. We actually, uh, my supervisor was asked to present to the White House this winter. So he did a presentation for um, a committee out of the White House, which was amazing. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, if you want to write down my contact info, yeah. <laughs> um, if you have geology related questions, please remember that I deal with rocks and things that are not alive. If you have questions about things that are alive, like people, I would reach out to the CDC. I get a lot of questions about, um, is this, this you know, result okay? And I can kind of go through those with you. But if you have questions about health um, effects or anything like that, I encourage you to reach out to the CDC. I've worked with the state toxicologist quite a bit on these projects and they're super smart, they're doing a really awesome job um, and they deal with things that are alive a lot more than I do. So um, if you have questions about policy or our program in general, Tracy Kelly is the program coordinator and she's, uh, she's leading the, um, the PFAS program with the DEP in an amazing way for such a complicated thing. She's doing a great job, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I heard you say that you can uh, filter this out of drinking water. You can. Right? So what does that look like? I, I, I know it's a big question that I'm thinking, but it's probably too big to be made. Mm -hmm. So you can get a filtering system for a home. Yep. That will actually remove all the feed tanks? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we have a couple contractors in the state that will install filters. So the way that it works with us, uh, because it's the state and you have to contract everything out and the lowest bidder, whatever. Um, we get these contractors on site um, and they are able to meet our specs um, and install filters. So yeah, it's usually two carbon filters. You can get um, a resin, uh, which is a man-made material that will pull the PFAS out that you can put in those tanks too. Um, but the carbon for all intensive purposes is the most cost efficient and effective. Uh, uh, Cool and big issues. Yeah. 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 So um, if we just have to install a, uh, um, like if you were to go out and just put in uh, the carbon filters, it would probably cost, it's under $5,000. Uh, depending on the contractor you get, if you want like all beautiful uh, copper piping or, you know, depending on what kind of system you want. Um, the filters don't uh, love it if there's a lot of, they don't love it. I'm, you know, if there's a lot of iron in the water. So if you have to put a softener in or a sediment filter or something, the um, price will, yeah, it'll change. Really encouraging, isn't it? mm -hmm. really, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. were you a, an intern at Fox? I was here in 2016. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so your entire success goes to your college and your college career. I do. Yes. <laughs> I learned a lot while I was here. It was a I great time. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what do you know about like the health impact? Because like we found the like when we were testing the soil, they were like. Is it really like, like what do you do if you find some stuff in the soil or like a soccer field? Like what what does that mean? Yeah, like it's playing on it. Like, is there like even like any on that yet? Or yeah, like that? that's where it's complicated. <laughs> um, there are so it's really strange because they don't affect. It's not. It doesn't affect just one organ in your body. Like it has uh, effects on like low birth weight on babies and there's cholesterol issues and stuff like that within the human body. Um, most of the, from what we know so far, we know that it's consumption. So if you were to go out and like eat handfuls of dirt off the soccer field, like that probably wouldn't be a good idea. I can tell you that as a geologist, don't do that. Um, but uh, the big, yeah, so consumption is the big issue. They're looking more into um, air, uh, the air pathway into the body. So um, in areas like that place in Vermont, where they are spraying the cannabis with PFAS, um, you know, it's depositing onto the ground, but the people are also breathing it in. Um, you'd think that wearing Gore-Tex jacket, um, you're hiking, your pores open and you're in direct contact with the Gore-Tex, I don't know. But you know, you'd think that there's some other ways for it to get in the body, but like the biggest issue is consumption. Yeah. So um, contact the CDC with specific questions about soccer fields. Yeah. Um, so for chemical circuit purpose, right? You want fire buying homes to suppress the flame. You don't want your clothing to catch on fire. Um, do you, is, is, it, is it tough being in an area where you want to have that as part of the setup or part of the um, flame retardant foam, but you also don't want it to have this, like you, you kind of, I, I get into a place where I feel kind of helpless because yeah. it serves a purpose, but it also has these residual effects later on that are really detrimental. Yeah, yeah, I had a really tough time. I was presenting um, to our hazmat team who, um, they go to chemical spills, um, the truck rollovers, stuff like that, and um, presenting to them. A lot of them are former firefighters and explaining to them about AFFF. And they were like, but it does a really good job. And I'm like, it does. So you just have to weigh the consequences. Like, do you, you know, you apply it and you save someone's life and then you just have to fix the problem because you can see that you're, you know, you can see the immediate threat at yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about, uh, I love the man doing this. Thank you so much for the whole presentation. Um, about the sustainability of this type of program, because obviously they're like up the top involved in installing these filters and then maintaining them over time. Mm -hmm. These are forever chemicals. How do you sustain a program like that? But I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. If you don't have answers on that, that's perfectly fine. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you'd like to see this program maybe in 20 years from now. Yeah. Kind of yeah, um, it's definitely something that's going to be around for a long time. Um, we don't, there's not a, a way to get it out of soil yet. Um, you can burn it at a very high temperature, but for the amount it would cost to do that, it's, you, we can't. Um, so there's a lot of companies that are working on that. So it's really, uh, again, it's an emotional, it's a hard thing to see the source and know that there's nothing I can do about it except try to protect groundwater. And you're right, the filters are going to need to be in for quite a while until we come up with a, um, a way to deal with it. Um, we have quite a bit of funding right now from the state and from the federal government. Um, I expect that as PFAS, um, beca so because Chris, so Chris Evans is my supervisor. He's the one that presented to the White House. They picked him out and said, oh, what does Maine need? Like, you guys are on top of this. What, like, what does this look like? What is this going to look like? Um, so I'm optimistic that there will hopefully be some long-term federal funding for this um, because, yeah, it's, it's, and we just know about, I mean, we're just really getting into the sludge sites and the AFFF sites and who knows all the other manufacturing sites that are gonna be popping up. Yeah. I don't know who went next, but I know you had your hand up before. Yeah. Yeah, so talking about um, there are PFAS in front of the environment, 
So I used to work with the team DEP, and I was called to the Bangor Airport. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, an accidental spill and a lot of foam when we got out of doors. So um, the Air National Guard, um, you know, they have these big tanker aircraft, and they do aerial refueling and uh, mm -hmm. other aircraft. And they keep these um, tankers in these large hangers. And so, so just imagine a Boeing 707 filled with jet fuel, mm -hmm. and they need to put out a fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they need to put it out fast. Right. And so they have this um, uh, fire suppression system where you turn it on and it floods this entire hangar with eight feet of foam yeah. on top of this airplane in 10 minutes. Yeah. 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 So that's where the stuff comes. Then they pull the plug. Yeah. And it goes to the somewhere. Yeah. Right. And then it goes into the South River. So, so you know, sending it to the wastewater treatment plant is kind of a good idea, except that they can't really. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Anson Mod Madison um, Wastewater Treatment Plant has actually put in a um, fractionation system that will hopefully be pulling PFAS out of their effluent, um, which is uh, really cool. If you think about those compounds right there, it's a chain and they have that head and they like to stick at the air water interface. And so basically you take that, um, that water and you bubble it up and you skim the foam off of the top. And then what's left in the water is really low. So there's things that the wastewater treatment plants can do. Um, and uh, yeah, but everybody's going to have to figure that out. And your sewer bill is probably going to go up to deal with it. But yeah, the, it's, I think that some of those um, big fire training areas are becoming more contained um, now that everyone's aware of what's going on. But yeah, it's the fire training areas are, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, to what extent do these materials spread from their source of the contaminated site, the site that are uncontaminated? For instance, are these chemicals volatile? Are they spread in the air? Do you find this in rainwater, for instance? Um, there's studies that it has been seen in rainwater. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, so there's I, the example of the um, the Denver airport, the manufacturing, it does get into the air if it's aerosolized, but once it's on the farm, like once, it, I know a lot about the sludge sites, once it's on the sludge sites, it's kind of stuck there. Um, what's not stuck there is the shorter chains, those get flushed out and they do move through the water. Um, they do get diluted um, and go somewhere away <laughs> into the world at concentrations we can't detect. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and maybe it's different with the different uh, carbon chain ones. So mm -hmm. How it uh, interacts in the water table, like which is the same or float or kind of do once it gets to that. It depends on the, the chains. Um, we've seen, so at that same site that I that I talked about, um, the this one um, at the site, the houses that are really close to the field, you can see some of the longer chain compounds in the water. But as you move away from the field, it's just the shorter chains. So we know that the longer chains might get stuck to the rock, the rock faces on those fractures. Um, but generally, these are pretty slippery molecules. They're um, they're designed to be really slippery, so they kind of just fly through the fly through the fractures. So they'll probably float mostly on the water table. Yeah, they like they like to be on bubbles. Um, I don't know if they would float necessarily the, to the top of the groundwater, um, but in a river or something, they usually sit at the top, like um, if you tested the foam at a you know waterfall or something versus the water at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, you'd see more up there. Let's see, are there any questions online, Danny? There are not. Okay, maybe we could take one more question and then Louise will be here to talk afterwards if there's one more. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, the water treatment, I'm assuming there's two big tanks of carbon work for a whole house treatment system. Mm -hmm. uh, we were thinking about just doing reverse osmosis for our drinking water. Is that 
Um, yes, it's a good option. Uh, the, the, the water that you drink is the most concentration that you'll take in. So if you use that, you're not, um, unless you like are constantly in the shower, like, like just drinking water in the shower, then like, I think that your drinking water is the number one priority. You don't, it's not a huge dermal contact issue. So, um, um, we've put in RO systems in some houses where there's no, like a, maybe a, uh, a property where there's no room for another filter or there's for some, sometimes we'll put a shed outside and heat the shed so that we can have those filters. So if the homeowner is really against the carbon filters or we can't fit them in, so we'll put in a, an RO system and um, I've tested some of them and they work really well. Um, I haven't done a ton of like side-by-side -side comparisons so I don't have a ton of um, specific information and I'm not, I'm a state employee and unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, we do that because it's the most cost effective for the state. It works and it's, it costs, it's the right price point, but it works. I showed the results. It really works very well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.